Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. I'm in center ring myself today because I want to spend time really talking about one of the toughest aspects of the divorce settlement and that's alimony or spousal support. We use different terms in different states. California, where I'm located, uses the term spousal support. Other states use alimony. We know alimony from movies and television shows, and other states call it maintenance. It is a little different in every state, but yet, to some degree, it exists in every state. I want to first share with you where this whole idea of spousal support slash alimony, and I'm going to use the words interchangeably, I want to share with you where it started. Because when I got into the divorce business, I thought, I think I really need to know the genesis of this. Where did it come from? Why does it still exist? Here's where it came from. The late 1800s, when in the United States, women simply didn't work. There were very few places where women work. Now, Miss Kitty in the saloon in Gunsmoke worked, and she looked like she had a lot of fun. But primarily, a woman's role was to raise children. And if they lived on a farm or an environment where there was a lot of work to do, growing your own food, supplying your own water, women did spend a lot of time working in that environment. Alimony spousal support was created back then so that when the children were raised and the marriage, which lasted maybe 20 years or so, 15, 20 years, life expectancy was a little less back then because, of course, we didn't have the medical, uh, we didn't have the medical uh, level that we have now and people shot one another. I mean, they shoot one another now, oh my God, please. But we had a lot of violence in those days. And so marriages didn't last 20, 25 years, but marriages lasted long enough that when the children were raised, if in fact the husband, who was the breadwinner, decided to take up with somebody else and leave his wife, The wife had money to live on. That's where alimony came from. So the woman wouldn't be without any means of support, and the man did have support. So that's the genesis of alimony in the United States. Well, we still have it today. There are rules around alimony, and they're different in every state. There are lengths of time that are different in every state. And so I wanted to go through that with you. But since this is our celebrity divorce series, it's the last Wednesday of the month, I did want to highlight celebrity divorces and whether there was alimony or not. So let's just look at the celebrities first because this is kind of fun. And then I'm going to read from you, read for you an overview of alimony and how it works for all of you. So I separated the categories in those who got alimony and those who did not get alimony. And you know, of course, my Bible is TMZ, always. And then Google Law School. So let's look at the celebrities who actually did have to pay alimony or are, or are in the process of paying. Well, the first one that sticks out is Robert De Niro. Now, Robert De Niro had a 20-year marriage and a couple children. When he got divorced, his alimony was $50,000 a month. Well, I mean, for somebody who earns as much as Robert De Niro, everything is subjective, right? But as Robert's career was winding down and he wasn't doing as many films, $50,000 50000 a month was an enormous amount of money and quite disproportional. So Robert did attempt to go back to the New York court system and have it modified. So let me spend a minute on modification. When the divorce settlement agreements are written, 
you can either write that mod, that spousal support is modified or not modified. So when I write spousal support agreements, that section within the overall divorce settlement agreement, I look at the couple and I say, well, look, this is the length of time you're agreeing to. It's, ve- it's either very open-ended until the recipient remarries or dies, one of you dies, or your money changes. So what happens when I'm dealing with a couple that is going to retire in a few years? You you have to take that into consideration and you have to write modifiable in the settlement agreement. I'm hoping that that was what Robert De Niro had in his settlement agreement. Because honestly, there is a point where people can't work. We either become physically impaired, mentally impaired, or the work isn't available. So what do you do? Spousal support is not designed to make the payor go broke while the recipient lives a wonderful life. Spousal support was designed to equalize the standard of living of both people. And that goes back to the late 1800s. One person is not supposed to leave the marriage living well while the other person is just about broke and could go homeless. That's not the reason for spousal support. Spousal support is designed to equalize whatever that standard of living is going forward. And so we have to be sensitive to that. So beware when you're having any mediator or an attorney write your settlement agreement, talk about the modifiability of the spousal support section. Now we look at something, someone very contemporary. We look at Kelly Clarkson. Now she's been in the news for a while, right? Uh, with Brandon Blackstock. Well, Kelly went from $200,000 a month. I know it's shocking. $200,000 a month temporary support to $150,000 a month Permanent. Now, what does permanent mean? Permanent means until the length of spousal support is over, the length of time. Well, Kelly was not married over 10 years, I don't think, to Brandon. So in California, again, I can only speak for California, please look up the alimony laws in your state. But in California, when you're married under 10 years, Spousal support is available half the length of the marriage. So it went from $200,000 a month temporary support to $150,000 a month, which was supposed to be written into the settlement agreement. But wait, we have a twist. There was a prenup, and the prenup was not really solidified in terms of the eyes of the court while spousal support was being paid. So Kelly's lawyer, Laura Wasser, who is a really famous lawyer in Los Angeles and is one of the lawyers who does mostly celebrity divorces. So Laura got the prenup upheld in court And now my question is, because I couldn't find this in anything that I was reading, please look this up on your own. Well, what happens to the spousal support that was already paid? Does Kelly get it back in payments? I mean, obviously a lot of it was spent, right? There is that standard of living that Brandon was used to. So what happens in a case where spousal support is being paid legitimately on a temporary basis, and then it starts getting written into the settlement agreement, and then the the prenup becomes upheld. And in the prenup, by the way, the ranch that was given to Brandon was taken back, and Kelly now owns it, and she can sell it, but Brandon's been living there and he has to leave. I know this is an aside from spousal support. But really and truly, this is my question. What happens to the spousal support that was already paid? Does it get cut off? Does Brandon just get to keep what he's already been paid and he has to move forward and he can't get any more? This is a very interesting twist to this particular divorce. And it was only very recently that the prenup was granted 
as legal and binding. So in the world of prenups, there's a lot of stipulations that go along with prenups that will either allow them to be held up in court or considered invalid. And so very important, any of you who have assets of high net worth, and you want to protect the assets going into the marriage that were already created individually, you have to each have attorneys. You can't write these prenups on your own. I still get people coming to my office that do have valuable assets, and they want to write their own prenup. No, you can't do that. And you can't force somebody to sign a prenup. That makes it invalid too. You have to allow enough time ahead of the marriage that forethought can be given, that negotiation can take place, so that if you get divorced, unfortunately, that prenup will be upheld. So I, Kelly won. I mean, this was great that she won. She gets the ranch back, which she bought and paid for. Unfortunately for Brandon, he doesn't get it anymore. But what happens to that spousal support? So I'm going to circle back in another podcast about this. We have to get, we have to do more research. But uh, that's the Kelly Clarkson divorce. Then we have Dr. Dre and Nicole. Oh my gosh, this is a tough one. So they married very young. And if anybody watched Straight Out of Compton, like I watched 8,000 times, they were so in love. And Nicole was right there at the beginning of Dre's career. Well, was there a valid prenup? Wasn't there a valid prenup? Laura Wasser is part of Dr. Dre's representation as well. And that's really an issue because supposedly this prenup can't be found. Okay, that's ridiculous. If you really have a prenup, the lawyers have copies of the prenup. We lose everything. We lose titles to our houses. We lose our birth certificates. I mean, people just just don't seem to hang on to anything that's really important, but the lawyers have it. But what happens if your lawyer dies? What happens if your lawyer's office closes? What happens if there's a fire and nothing was converted to digital representation? Now you've got a serious problem on your hands. But you know what? I know it's a contentious divorce, but there's so much money on Dre's side. You know, this is one of those situations where, yes, this is hugely toxic. This is not an amicable divorce. But you know how to end it? Pay her payer. You know, I I ran into a doctor. I I had to get some pre-op clearance recently for an operation that I was having. And after the pre-op exam was done, I was talking to the doctor and she said, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, oh, I'm a divorce mediator and a, and a, a legal document preparation company. She said, oh my God, let me tell you about my divorce. And she, she out earned her husband. And she said at some point after the legal bills were mounting and they had a child and it was getting contentious, she didn't want her child to be a casualty of the divorce. And she just simply said to her husband, name your price, just name your price. Shocking, isn't it? And she went over her attorney's head. She said, I'm done paying legal fees. I'm done arguing. This is about my child. I can afford it, name your price. And he did. And he didn't think she was going to pay it. And she did. And she got her child back. Her child is happy. She can always make more money. And that's something I would like all of you to think about. You can argue yourselves to death. You can collect injustices all you want. But at the end of the day, it's going to come to some type of resolution nail it, end it. Why waste your valuable time? Didn't the pandemic teach us that time is uncertain? We never know how many days we have left. Just stop arguing about something. If you can afford to end it, end it. And then we have a really famous client that I had. I am not going to share his name because I did not get his clearance and his name was not in the media. 
but we are talking extremely high net worth. His spousal support was around 30, 35,000 a month. And I mediated that divorce. He was very generous. I was so proud of him. I really was. He was very generous. And then his job transitioned. He did not have the means to pay that kind of money. I did not mediate anything further for him. And I do believe that it was modifiable in the divorce settlement agreement because when you're in entertainment, when you're in media, when you're in anything high profile, your job can end tomorrow. And so what looks good now and what you're willing to pay now, you may not be able to pay. And so if I can impress anything on all of you that are in high net worth positions, that word modifiable is so extremely important. Not that you may not want to continue to be generous, but there's a reality about this. You may not be able to continue to be generous. And folks, you don't need $35,000 a month to be happy. You can be happy on less. So modifiable is the name of the game. And then I had another client who definitely was not at that enormously high net worth level. But he did have to pay spousal support. Now, they both worked. He just made a lot more money than her. He was an attorney, but not in family law. So he was smart. He said, look, this whole idea of paying spousal support is really getting to me. Why can't we just divide our assets and walk away? So he called a family law attorney who was a friend of his. And the attorney said, it's the law. It's just the law. You're an attorney, I'm an attorney, we are bound to uphold the law, it's the law, and you just have to deal with it. So they negotiated a sum of money that worked for both of them, and you can negotiate. You know, we have this thing called the Disso Master in California, it's a calculator, that is a starting point to a discussion for temporary support. It's high. When people negotiate a more permanent number that goes into the settlement agreement, they negotiate a little lower, like around 15, 20% lower. And so he just bit the bullet and they negotiated a sum of money and that was that. Now, by the way, there are two ways to negotiate. You can either do a lump sum or you can do monthly. Nobody likes monthly. Monthly keeps bringing you back to that well. It keeps bringing you back to the marriage. And when you're getting divorced, you don't want to keep being brought to the marriage and those monthly obligations. So if you're in the position to negotiate a lump sum that's generous enough that the recipient says, okay, I can do a lot with this. A, I can invest it. And B, I don't have to wait every month. I don't then have to be obligated. And if you're the recipient and you want to punish your spouse by making your soon-to-be ex-spouse pay a monthly amount, woe to you. That's just mean-spirited. Stop doing it. Even if your soon-to-be ex-spouse was horrifying, just don't do it for your own mental health. And financially, if it's a large amount of a a, a one-time lump sum, you can invest it. You can do a lot more with it. And so it's to your advantage to take a lump sum. So I'm passing that along to you. And then lastly in my column of they had to pay, I don't know if you're like me and you watch the Bravo reality shows. I do. I don't watch them as much as I used to for reasons I'm not going into. But the Orange County Housewives, a few seasons ago, had Shannon and David Bedore, hugely wealthy. They lived in, I don't know, an 80,000 million square foot mansion, God knows. And Shannon was a stay-at-home mom. They had three girls. There was spousal support in that marriage. And it was a sufficient amount of money. I think it was maybe 25,000 a month. 
Anyway, it was a sufficient amount of money. She lived in a huge house. I mean, there was money to burn. But I'm wondering in their divorce settlement, if they didn't have something called the Gavron warning. In California, we have this thing called the Gavron warning, and it's case law. So Mildred Mildred and Bernard Gavron, years ago, had this divorce case, and they set a limit to how long spousal support was going to be available, and the deal was that Mildred had to get a job at some point in time. Well, on what was that date? It was July 24th of 2019. I interviewed the daughter of Mildred and Bernard Gavron. Her name was Denise Gavron. Denise actually went into the legal business, not family law, but she ended up going into labor law. And Denise was in her first year of college, so she was not a minor child. But she wanted to talk about what it was like as an adult child of that divorce, with that divorce being a case precedent for limiting the number of years of spousal support. And she actually doesn't agree with spousal support. Go listen to the interview. It's very interesting. Again, July 24th, 2019. It was the first year I did this podcast, and it was under the name Constructive Uncoupling. It wasn't the amicable divorce expert at that time. But if you go on YouTube, you can go back to that date and you can listen to the interview. And Mildred never got a job. Even though this is case law precedent used by some people in the divorce settlements to limit the number of years for spousal support, Mildred never got a job. Mildred actually lived with her mother who had money. I just think this is all very fascinating history. So anyway, so those are the people that got spousal support. Let me talk about the celebrities that did not have spousal support as part of their settlements, to my knowledge. Let's start with Bethany Frankel. First of all, I'm a big Bethany Frankel fan. Years ago in the 90s, I worked with Bethany Frankel. I was producing entertainment for the events business, and Bethany was an event producer with Merv Griffin Productions. Bethany was hardworking. She was always into health. I remember going to the office where she worked, and there were a lot of event planners at this office. She would actually be eating crudite. This woman walks her walk and talks her talk. I have never seen anybody work harder and support health. So when she went into being a natural food chef and we saw her, we first saw her on, I believe it was the, um, um, oh, the Martha Stewart Apprentice and then on the Donald Trump Apprentice, uh, she was being a natural food chef. And I said, oh, my God, I can't believe Bethany is such an enterprising person. But I remember when she was on the New York City Housewives, Real Housewives of New York City, I remember the episode when I, when I thought to myself, she's going to get divorced. I know she's going to get divorced. And here was the episode. She, she had not sold the business to Seagram's yet. She was not wealthy. Um, she was earning money by being one of the housewives. And she was dating, uh, she was dating, she had just married Jason Hoppy, who was in real estate. And I believe they were living in her very small apartment. I remember the episode where she said, I got mine, you have to go out and get yours. And I said, oh my God, that is crushing to a man. And this is what I want to say to women who out earn men. Generally, the marriages don't work out. We are still not culturally there for a woman to be able to be satisfied without earning a man. So whereas men hate to be tied to their spouses and pay spousal support once the divorce is final, they hate it. They don't want to be connected to the marriage through spousal support. That's how they feel about it. You want to see a, a caged animal ready to break loose? It's a woman who out earns a man and has to pay and has to pay spousal support. Oh my God, it just doesn't work. But 
Spousal support, alimony is not gender specific, it's income specific. So women, be very, very clear. If you out earn men, you are going to pay spousal support unless it's in the prenup. So I really feel badly for Bethany. She worked her behind off to get where she is. And it was a huge settlement. I kind of don't think think there was spousal support. There was a prenup, my God. But see, Jason helped negotiate that Seagram's deal for her. And when there is a huge asset settlement, that's when spousal support goes out the window. And I've seen it happen in my own divorces. So I had a couple here in LA. It was a $25 million settlement. He didn't balk at all. He, he was the breadwinner. He didn't balk at it at all. He split everything right down the middle. No negotiation whatsoever, right down the middle. But because it was the largest settlement I had ever done, I said, please, after I write your settlement agreement, please take this to an attorney. Vet it. Make sure all the right legal bells and whistles are assigned to every piece of that settlement. And the attorney even said, you know, there's not going to be spousal support. I mean, you're walking away with $12.5 million each, no spousal. But he ended up paying for all the school, private school expenses, college, because he was going to continue to earn money. She wasn't, he was. So she could invest her twelve point five, dollars and she got the unbelievable gorgeous mansion. And she could afford it, but he paid for all the school expenses. Like Kelly Clarkson, part of her settlement was um, she got the ranch back, but she was going to pay the bulk of her children's expenses. And that's kind of the way it works. And then there is actually a fairly famous retailer by the name of Fred Siegel in Southern California. Fred came to the company I bought from the original owner of this company, Divorce Resource Incorporated. Fred had three divorces, I am told, and two of the three were done with this company before I owned it. And I am told by the former owner that he said, give her whatever she wants. I can always make more money. There was just no argument. And that to me is worth gold. If you are the higher earner, and you know you can continue to make more money and you're young in your career, why pay all the legal fees? Pay the lawyers to do the right job writing the settlement agreement. But what's the point of arguing? You know, I'm a mediator and I watch people argue until they can't argue anymore. And then you eventually come to a settlement. But Fred Siegel, give her anything she wants. I can always make more money. Then we have. Well, another current uh, celebrity, Kaylee Cuckoo. I don't think there's spousal support because it never was mentioned in the divorce, um, the divorce uh, media stories. And it didn't look like a horrible divorce. It actually looked like it was pretty easy. So I'm kind of thinking there was no spousal support there. Oh my God, poor Erica Jane. Erica Jane and Tom Girardi. You know, if Erica had left years ago before all this legal stuff came down with Tom, I am sure she would have gotten spousal support. I am sure. But Erica said in one of the episodes of this current uh, season of the Beverly Hills Housewives on Bravo, when asked, why didn't you leave earlier when you saw the marriage was disintegrating, you actually had a career of your own. I mean, she was singing and dancing years ago. Why didn't you leave? And she said on camera, well, where was I going to go? Well, you're going to go wherever any other person goes. You're going to get your own apartment. You're going to go where you are now, which is somewhere else. Tom's just not going to be paying for everything for you. So she's going to get nothing. There is no spousal support to get. There is no money. And now, and now Eric is going to be on the hook. Listen, I know that Tom was in the personal injury business and the, apparently, allegedly, a lot of the money he gave Erica to support her career came from not paying the victims their settlement. And this is horrifying. Did Erica know? I don't know. 
I, I don't know what Erica would have known about the money that Tom was making and not paying at the law firm. I mean, some of his own lawyers supposedly didn't even know what was going on. So I don't know. But here's what I do know. Don't hang on for money. If you know your marriage is over, get out and start your own life. Do not hang on for money. Doing things for money, being in relationships for money, when the relationship doesn't fulfill you, when it doesn't enhance you spiritually, emotionally, go out and make your own money. And you will be successful. Erica is so talented. I love her songs. I love the way she performs. I, I don't think she needed Tom's money. But anyway, that's the way it turned out. And there is no spousal support for Erica Jane, Erica Girardi. Then we have Denise Richards and Charlie Sheen. So Denise, when she was on the Beverly Hills Housewives, said in one of the reunion shows, the only thing she asked for was child support. She did not ask for spousal support. Well, Denise has always been an actress and a model. So maybe she would have never gotten it. And she said that at the point of getting married, nine and a half men had not happened yet. And Charlie didn't have the wealth that he had once that show hit success. But I thought it was very cool of Denise to only want to deal with spousal, um, excuse me, child support. I thought that was very hip and cool of her. I really applauded her for that. And I applauded her for the way she included Charlie, at least she said this on the show, in her children's lives. Now, stuff that's happened since then, I'm not going to speak to that. I'm only going to speak to the spousal support aspect. Unlike now Camille and Kelsey Grammer. Okay, so Camille was early on in the Beverly Hills Housewives and they didn't have a prenup. I kind of don't think there was spousal support as part of this divorce because it was a $50 million settlement. A hundred million split into 50 million. So again, learning from the attorneys who I work with, when there is enormous money being exchanged for asset settlement, you don't have spousal support. You invest that money and you can live on it. And then we have Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Now, I did a couple celebrity divorce episodes on them. Yes, of course, there was a prenup. They're both enormously wealthy. So spousal support was never part of their asset, it was never part of their agreement. But that custody battle goes on. That hasn't ended yet. And I'm so very sorry for the kids. I really, really am. And I hope it works out okay. And then we have Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. No, there's no spousal support there. They each have their own money. They're hugely wealthy. No need for it. You know, but the big part of their divorce, again, is, of course, raising the children together. And then we have, finally, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. Well. Do, do they need spousal support, um, Mackenzie and Melinda? No. I mean, their settlement is in the billions of dollars. So no need for spousal support there. I want to read to you, though. I wanted to, get, I wanted to highlight all the celebrities. And now I want to read to you from an article that I pulled down that I think covers everything in terms of spousal support. And I was really, I found this article when I was looking for states to say, well, do you have spousal support? Does every single state have alimony? Well, it seems that every state does, but to different degrees and on different terms. So I thought this was a really good article to read to all of you. And it's called Divorce Financial Solutions. Um, and Google this. It's just Google that. I don't know where else. Divorce Financial Solutions. And it's a blog. And the title of this particular article is Does My State Have Alimony? So here we go. While divorce ends a marriage, the financial relationship between you and your ex just doesn't end. Whether you're dealing with child support or alimony, the financial relationship can go on for many years and in some cases may be permanent. In many marriages, one spouse earns more than the other. 
In case of a divorce, the earning discrepancy means the financially stable partner needs to provide financial support to enable their ex-spouse to establish a new post-divorce life. What exactly is alimony? And by the way, this is me. This does not mean punishment for the spouse who earns more. This is not supposed to level the spouse who earns more. Again, Alimony is supposed to equalize the standard of living going forward. So please keep that in mind. Back to the article. Spousal support or alimony is financial assistance available only to legally married spouses seeking a divorce. We do not have common law marriage, by the way, in California. So if you've been together for 15 years and married three years in California, Spousal support is available half the length of the marriage, one and a half years. Tough, isn't it? Uh, It's a partner's contribution that ensures their ex-spouse or recipient achieves their financial independence after divorce. While spousal maintenance or spousal or support may seem like a straightforward affair, it's covered by different laws with each state having different provisions. Spousal support starts during a legal divorce or separation and enables the receiving spouse to cover their necessities until they become financially stable or remarry. Again, modifiable if the recipient is earning money, which by the way, and this is an aside, you may feel that the only right thing to do is to receive spousal support. You put your your soon-to-be ex-spouse through college, you enabled your ex-spouse to earn a living, and to provide a wonderful income for the family. And I get it. And perhaps the deal was, honey, I'll stay home, or honey, you stay home, raise the children, I'll earn the money. And that's great when that can happen. And then the divorce happens. And the spouse who's earned the money wants to cut the other spouse off. Uh Uh-uh, not okay. Come on. You have to go back to, if it's a long-term marriage, you took your spouse out of the labor force. Now, how are they supposed to get back in? What if what they used to do isn't around anymore? What if they're old enough that it's very difficult to get a job? What if they're not the type of person who can open their own business? I mean, you do have to look at these factors if you're the uh, wage earner. You have to. But I know circumstances that cause the divorce are the backdrop to how you feel about this and what you want to do about it in terms of meeting your legal and financial obligations. It's really tough stuff. And, And it's not to be taken lightly. And I, as a mediator... I don't render judgment on anybody. I just think we ought to have to look at all considerations when we're talking about spousal support. Spousal support starts during a legal divorce or separation and enables the receiving spouse to cover their necessities until they become financially stable or remarry. Expenses covered include clothing, food, housing, essential travel, auto insurance, gas, tuition fees, and health insurance. So so listen, in California, when spousal support is paid, you don't have to cover other expenses for your spouse. If what you're paying in spousal support is enough for your spouse to cover their own expenses, great. If it's not, the recipient has to get a job to make up for what their living expenses are. So this is how important this discussion is. It's really a sensitive discussion. So depending on what the higher earning spouse makes, their portion of spousal support may not be able to sustain the spouse. And if you want to pay for extra expenses, fine. That's great. That's generous. That's wonderful. But you don't have to. So getting a job to supplement your income for X number of years just may be the way you have to go. Not all divorcing spouses qualify for alimony, especially when both spouses are financially independent and can comfortably cover their own needs. So that goes back to if the asset division is so huge, there will not be spousal support. So who qualifies for alimony? Alimony is issued according to different terms 
and on a case-by-case basis. And here they are. Each spouse's earning capacity, property and asset accumulation for each spouse, debts by each spouse. Debts are big. What if one spouse can cover all of your debts? That may be um, a diminishing of spousal support. Those debts are important. Um, number, Number four, business entities for both parties, including shared ones. Contribution of each party towards the marriage, for example, non-monetary, like caring for children or being the homemaker. I mean, that's, you know, sweat equity, so to speak. Prenuptial agreements before marriage, physical age and mental health condition of the recipient, accustomed lifestyle. Now, let me just say something quickly about that. Maybe with spousal support, if it's within the legal realms of what is payable, maybe that can, that allows you to have the same lifestyle. But two households on one income does not normally afford the same lifestyle. And so typically both ex-spouses have to decrease their lifestyle for a while and then rebuild. And so it, it's a fallacy to think that the recipient of spousal support should live the same lifestyle while the payor cannot. I I mean, it's just a fallacy of thinking and it's ridiculous. No, the equalization of the lifestyle going forward is where uh, spousal support comes in. Certain factors may also disqualify a person from receiving alimony, like a history of abuse or certain charges on their criminal record. This is huge, and you definitely need an attorney for this discussion. Additionally, if the receiving spousal doesn't, oh, if, if the receiving spouse doesn't have anything preventing them from working, like small children, then alimony may not be ordered if you go in front of a judge. Types of alimony. Like many matters governed by state laws, alimony statutes vary from each state. However, we can categorize the forms of alimony in four ways. They include lump sum. I mentioned this earlier. The recipient of lump sum alimony received the payment once and in bulk. This is customarily awarded in lieu of a property settlement. When a spouse is not entitled to receive spousal support according to the state law, it means the court determines the division of the marital assets to support the receiving spouse. The lump sum payment depends on factors such as the size of the marital estate and the needs of the recipient spouse. Number two, permanent alimony. Permanent spousal support or alimony is awarded to the recipient until they remarry or the payee, payor, dies. Then it's really over. The amount depends on the receiving spouse's age, living expenses, health, and contribution made during the marriage. However, some states have a cohabitation clause that may suspend or terminate permanent spousal support. If the recipient spouse lives with a new partner, the court may end the alimony regardless of whether the new partner provides support. I cannot tell you how important this is. So people tend to go into other relationships. If you like to be in relationship, even though this one is ending, you may go into another relationship. And so if you are the recipient of spousal support and you cohabitate, And you say, well, listen, uh, that person doesn't contribute. You may be in a state that it doesn't matter. Just having somebody there and going on the honor system that they don't contribute, you know, the judge may may not go for that. Permanent alimony may be adjusted if the circumstances change. These can include the recipient receiving financial freedom through the winning of the lottery, that happens, getting a high-paying job, an inheritance, or or incurring medical expenses. Payments may be reduced if the paying partner retires, experiences job loss, or a reduction in income. Okay, so the pandemic is a perfect example that changed the game temporarily to the payment of spousal support, even child support. So a lot of people weren't working during the pandemic. 
And so in the family law community in California, especially in Los Angeles, I'm on the listserv for a couple of the bar associations. And that was a big discussion. Oh my gosh, I have a client who's paying spousal support, but his job is, or her job is temporarily suspended. What do we do? The courts are closed. Nobody's hearing cases like this. And I was so proud of the legal community in that case. And they all said, we just have to talk to our clients and have them mediate with one another and temporarily do their best. Because if somebody's not earning an income, what are you supposed to do? If they were paying and they were consistent paying, the intention was there okay, everybody has to live, right? Well, you do your best to get together and you handle the expenses cooperatively and then you kind of build in maybe a payback plan. But I have to tell you, the legal community, the lawyers really stepped up. Each and every one of them that I saw on the list serve and said, we have to calm our clients down. Because this is one of those examples where life gets in the way. We didn't see it coming, but we have to deal with it. Number three, temporary support. So temporary alimony is awarded for a shorter period of five years or less in many cases. It's given to the recipient spouse to support themselves after divorce as they find ways to be financially independent. Usually the court grants temporary alimony according to the receiving partner's potential earning level and education and will most likely be awarded when the court feels the spouse needs additional support to establish their life after the divorce. The recipient's lifestyle during the marriage determines that amount. But, you know, everything is subjective and you just have to... Again, you have to realize this is not punishment to the payor, and it's not designed to level the financial existence of the payor. So payors, please don't freak out. You're not going to be homeless. And then number four, rehabilitative. Rehabilitative spousal support caters towards obtaining training or career education to enable the recipient to start earning an income. It covers living and education expenses for three years or less. Well, I don't really know about that. I have not dealt with this in my career. I haven't heard about this. This may be according to another state. I don't know. But just for you to know, there are a lot of different factors that go into the establishing of spousal support. And everybody has to be open to negotiating. Everybody has to be open to, we all have to live going forward. So be as negotiable with each other as you can. If you have high net worth assets going into the marriage, get a prenup. But I know the reason for the marriage is always the backdrop to the negotiation for spousal support or the negotiation for anything. And that has to be sorted out in the emotional divorce before you go into the legal divorce. So I hope this has been helpful to all of you in the discussion of spousal support, especially when you look at what the really high net worth people go through. Some have to pay, some don't. I hope that all of you going forward in the discussion of spousal support can be as empathetic with each other as you can possibly be, but also look out for yourselves too. I thank each and every one of you for joining me in this episode. Please go to my website, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. Let me know if this was helpful. Let me know if there are any topics coming up that you would like me to discuss. And as always, Have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else.